Hello and welcome to the Reflection Show with me, Martha Winspire. Today we want to have a conversation with an amazing man who has made an impact in my life as well and also passionate about youth development, youth empowerment. Before we started, there were those championing youth empowerment or youth development in the north, let me say in Tamale. That time it was the three northern regions. We learned from them, we copied from them, we have heard from them, and today we are also doing something that they love to do as well. Not so active in the youth empowerment space now, but the seeds that he had sown in my life and the lives of many other people have grown to become outstanding young people. He has a lot of things that he's doing. If you've heard of Cow Tribe, this is the man behind it, Mr. Peter Awin. He's a co-founder of Cow Tribe Technology. Um, they have offices or places. In fact, he would, he would tell us everything about Cow Tribe and the other things that he does. Let's take, let's take a break. We'll be back. Books by Pastor A. L. Fant. They are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Simple to comprehend, relevant in application, and so lovely to read. Grab copies like Dynamics of Kingdom Influence, Dynamics of Ministry, Marcus King for Church Workers, Money Matters, and she calls herself a woman. This marriage must work. No more curses, loaded mouth, secrets of kingdom dominion, the exploits of service, things fall apart, church without bleeding pulpit, singles mingle, and many more. Welcome back from the break. I'm super excited about this episode because it it takes me back to how many years? Um, eleven years. Yeah, I think um, I, I, I feel it was twenty twelve years. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, so that is um, uh, eleven years mm. now. When when he, so he organized the Afri Lead Empowerment Program for about three days that we went. It's it's a great honor to have you here, Peter. Thank you. Now, I just look back and I say thank you for some of the deposits that you planted in our lives. Of course, we didn't know we'd get this far, but I think you started the youth empowerment-ish and we jumped on it. I was a little girl by that time. And now I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> now I'm an adult. Yes. Peter Awin. Who is Peter Owen? Uh, um, and thank you for having me on this program. I have been watching you from afar and it's just with pride. Um, what you do is amazing. And I think um, if we have many of you in the northern part, not just Ghana, but the northern mm -hmm. part of you know uh, the country doing what you do, I'm sure we will probably have a lot of success stories, you know, okay. um, educate from now. Mm -hmm. um, myself uh, what do i describe myself my uh, let me say um what i like not mm. who i am and uh, i like to watch things grow small things grow mm. and so that best describes the kind of person i am mm. um i come from a very very humble home um and when I say humble, I actually mean mm. uh, most uh, majority of people coming from the northern part mm. have tasted poverty before. Mm. And, uh, and that's humility because mm. then as you grow, it shapes you and it guides mm. you and it, 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 it allows you to see the world in a different mm. way. Mm. Um, my dad um, did, was one of the few people in my village that mm. went to school. Okay. Um, actually, he was just among two people that 
ventures, ventured when the white fathers came. Okay. He followed them to school because he was really, really curious man. Mm. Um, later, some, some of them joined, but they, they just got tired of, you know, mm. sitting at one place. And, mm. and the fact that he went to school, mm. we got to also follow him out of the yeah. village. Yeah. Um, and so I got to, to travel a lot with my dad. Mm. So I can say at the time I was going to school in the Upper West, mm. I had seen about eight out of the 10 regions then, wow. uh, which tells you the diversity of um, the growing up uh, mm, aspect of had, my life. Yeah. So, um, but to come back a bit, I went to St. Charles Minor mm. Seminary. Okay. Before that, hey. I went to Zudwili. <laughs> Um, uh, JHS okay. uh, in Tamale, but I joined them in Form 3 because okay. I was elsewhere. Mm. I had been moved a lot. Mm. Um, but then I went to St. Charles, a boys' school. It shaped me in a certain mm. way. We can talk about that later. <laughs> um, and then right after high school, I went to UDS. Mm. Um, I did integrated development studies mm. in WA, which mm. is one of that the best courses. That was a course I wanted to do, but I never had It's an chance. amazing course. I think if there's anything to talk about the course, and again, I know some of my lecturers um, are now very big people in the university. Some are mm. out of the, the country now. Mm. But at that time, they would tell you that you would be uh, a jack of all, a master of none. Mm. And so it shaped the way that we saw mm. life, you know. And, and, and it was amazing because we're the second badge of that course in okay. WA. Okay, wow. And, and so it's it, kind of like pioneers. And mm. I look back and see that it shaped uh, my, my life. And right after that, um, university in 2017, I tried to get myself, you know, into the development mm. job, you know, join an NGO, you know, be a community developer, yeah. you know, that's what they, they, they shape you to be. Yeah. And, and so working with a couple of organizations, I just realized it didn't, it, I wasn't cut for that yeah. because there was so much uh, that I wanted to do, Out of but, your belly. But, the, but the environment and, and the structure of work and all those things were just distracting that energy. Mm. Um, so I just quit and I tried to, you know, pursue my passion, which was to start supporting young people um, who were struggling with self-identity, mm -hmm. self-awareness struggling because of the environment we mm. come from in the mm. north here mm. people don't understand what it means to be a northern person mm. but we come from that environment where you are shut down that when you are actually at your adolescence and you are getting to become a, mm. a, a an adult mm. it it begins to you know to 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 bring down your confidence and mm. that is the experience i had myself mm. so i said no i, I don't want to sit there and watch young people grow up to become adults that yeah. just want to follow the status quo and all yeah. that let's you know let's bring up spice up the way young people so was that when you started um afri lead so afri lead started as lead ghana okay you know afri lead started as lead ghana and the lead clubs were everywhere mm. um and then the idea was to just give the opportunity like you, know, you remember just the environment for people to express themselves um, and then later we realized that we should put it together as an organization and mm. then we later registered as AfriLead, right? Mm. Um, but AfriLead happened in 2012, but Lead Ghana started in 2018. Okay. Yeah. So I remember uh, the first campaign we did and again, it built a lot of confidence in myself because I remember when, um, when did uh, Obama come to Ghana? I think Do that was remember? the same year. No, that was 2008. Thank you. If I can remember. So that was when we had Lead Ghana. Okay. And we had to buzz young people to just come. We wrote a lot of letters to the to the president of Ghana. Mm. All high schools, junior high schools. I think it was schools. a president then. That was a, At the late, yeah, yeah, the late professor. So uh, we, wrote, we wrote letters to just invite him to the north. And just come in. And I remember Black Rasta then you know you know there was some vibrancy around why is it that all the presidents ah, all so the visitors a letter that when obama gets into ghana he should at least come to the north he should come to the north because none of these presidents ever come here that's true and even our recent um what's the name back to the root or how do they call it uh the one they did then then the year of return yes I, I didn't see a lot of it happening exactly. in the north so 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 it was it was a bit 
you know, as a young person, I'm like, you know, one day we were having conversation just among uh, about just my network. And this whole Obama is coming. And that man inspired me a lot. I remember the elections and how I followed it. I was still in Zabzugu. There was no internet there. And I had this small radio that I would listen the whole night just to hear how the election went. Mm -hmm. And then he had the chance to, we had a chance to, to, visit, uh, to, to host yeah, him in yeah. Ghana. And he didn't show up here. You know, he, he so, so if you look at it, um, at that point, I started ask, asking myself, what is it about the North that doesn't deserve, mm. you know, such, you know, hospitality? I mean, mm. we are very hospitable people. Mm. We like to also have that experience like that, what happens in the, in the southern parts, but no one gives us a chance. And so we wrote thousands of letters, young people. We wrote to the, the White House, and I remember, you know, um, one of the big people there uh, called and like, is that Peter? Yes, I'm like, who is this and like okay i'm the team you know organizing for the president to come unfortunately we organized this like eight months ago so we cannot change the schedule. the schedule for him to come but we do recognize that's what they did like eight months before the travel absolutely it's like security that's wise, like a it's not year possible. it was <laughs> it was a whole lot of planning right wow so but then just reading that letter back to the young people going to all the high schools and say this is what we heard from the, the the white house you have a voice you have a voice if we can use that then we can have more mm. uh coming our way so then i realized you know we could do something and mm. it, it became just part of me waking up every day and thinking about how do we get young people to be more active mm. in their environment mm. what i mean that is where uh Afri i'm started. looking at your criteria for selecting students, I think you chose eight per school, four boys and four girls. And you wanted two groups, two girls and two boys in a particular group. And you asked each group to write, um, did I say an article or to write something on any topic of their choice? How did you come out with that? Because I remember when Afridid came and I was in Obisco by then, you asked that everybody was all over, everybody wanted to come until so you brought that criteria and the numbers dropped i think um i wrote in fact i i wrote the article and i didn't have people to join me i was telling <laughs> you that story later even when you met in, in Accra a few days ago yeah, i was telling yeah. you how um yeah i was called MD in school you know that <laughs> how they didn't want to, nobody wanted to join my my group and i remember i had to write the article myself it was on cholera i don't know where i got the wisdom to write that and i had to now go and beg friends to just let them join my my group and i think the other group was the sp asp gp agp with those selected what made you bring that criteria out and what made you to choose those to, I, I don't know um, uh, on what topic they wrote on but i don't know what was so outstanding about our topic that's made it to your list so um just just to put a context to what you are talking about um so part of what I had envisioned is an annual conference of young people mm. that um, allowed, you know, you know, out of the busy academic schedules, every year you could have young people just come together mm. um, in one location. No matter how small it is, mm. we would bring everybody together mm. to just think about and envision life mm. every year, mm. an annual conference. And I, I remember the one you attended was the second ever conference. Was that it the organized. second in 20, it was, was it 13 or 12? So we had done three before I stopped. Okay. Um, yeah. So we did one before you joined. Okay. And the second one was your conference. Okay. And the third one did happen, but I can't remember. So we did 11, 12 and 13. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think I came in 2012. Okay. So that was the second the one, one because the first one was at a um, pastoral, pastoral center. center. No, I was at that one. Oh, okay. I was at the pastoral center one. Yes. 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 Oh, then I think I came for two years. I was at the pastoral center one. Yeah. And then um, that one was just in then Tamale. The UDS one was, was. The pastoral center was yeah, just people in Tamale. Tamale and now yes. just for a weekend, Friday, yes. Saturday, and Sunday. Exactly. Then the other one at UDS was, I think it was the like mid really or vacation. Exactly. It was, yeah. We had people from even St. Xavier in Wa and Co coming. Yeah. The Boggies, all yeah. those places. Oh, then I was there together. for two years. Yeah. 
it's it's been long so if you don't remember <laughs> <it's> not, <laughs> yeah, yeah i was there for two years um but th the idea was to just you know it, it was an inexpensive you know project you know yeah. bring young people bring them for a weekend or three days four yeah. days and just let them you know network because you know what um one thing you do when you grow up in a very affluent community is that you go to school with the very you know rich people so as you grow you grow along with mm. with them right mm. so if if your friend is a banker somewhere you meet the person there it makes you who you are mm. our network is what makes us exactly um unfortunately when you are in a the northern part where all the schools are just all busy busy and the you know the the, the graduation rate is very low you know performance is very low you need a system where people can grow together mm -hmm. people can you know have the same interest can mm -hmm. grow together mm -hmm. and that was the whole idea because we needed to create a young a group of young people 10 years later they can look back and say we started That's you know true. and and yeah. that is what i was looking at because it, it is really really difficult for for you to maintain vibrancy in an environment if you don't have set programs so that was the whole con concept of having the anwa baoba um mm. you know yeah. youth leadership program yeah um and baoba again is yeah. that kind of like you know it is <laughs> you cannot I remember encircle. the first one was highlighted the baoba yes yeah I remember with that your t-shirt with the baoba bear. that's true um but the idea was that you can't encircle one individual cannot encircle the baoba because it's a very big mm. tree you need multiple people to hold to hands across and that was just the whole idea um so we had the Bible circle right um and and i do recognize that uh, you know there were several programs of that nature and people just show up because there is good food maybe there's there's <laughs> food and there's an opportunity to leave the house you know and tell your parents who oh, i'm going for this to really meet people but not just um, necessarily exactly so you know that whole idea of writing um about a topic really meant that you put a, a top to it you know and that was just about that and i i remember reading really really interesting you know um topics and so inspiring i, I can't remember everything i wish but i could I, remember mine I, I remember all the interesting <laughs> topics yeah. that were written and yeah. I, it, it's really really uh something that i believe if it had continued you know you would have probably a bigger have, conference yeah, now exactly. yeah yeah so why did it stop was it funding? I think I got tired. I got tired and I always played. Um, so, you know, um, AfriLead, you know, changed a bit because there is something, and again, I'm just going to give it a time so that you, we don't, um, if you are too innovative, um, people don't appreciate what you do okay i think at the time that we we're doing these programs you can remember how the headmasters and the head assistant headmaster i faced that situation exactly. my events. Yeah. and and so the i was not i didn't know what i was going into i think i was very naive at that time and you know i was i think you didn't accept the challenges it came with no i didn't even know the challenges yes. you know it's like one thing getting into something that you you know you get the results and it's good and you move so you on. thought that all the head teachers should say oh it's good pizza absolutely. let's go it's good and all the support absolutely come, but it so wasn't. so so i stopped and i'll tell you this when i stopped that program i went to work at the ghana uh, education regional office mm. i worked there for six months just to understand why is it that things mm. don't work at the school level and when i understood i realized that look high school it's not the place to start okay because high school is the, the students are treated like you know still young and they need so if you want such a program to work go to the university level when they have some independence okay so we moved we moved to university level so we're now doing the kickstart 48 which is like a boot camp similar okay. to that but it was for university students mm. so we did different university programs right so it wasn't as though I, I feel sad that I didn't continue, but I feel, you know, it, as you grow and as you learn about the problem, you approach it differently. And I did change my method slightly. And I think 
for those who came for my Kickstarter, I think there's this bread boy who is selling bread. I think you should interview him. Mm -hmm. he's, he's from one of my programs, right? Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of them who are out of this country. They are doing different things altogether. There's one who is just gone to um, I understand that he's just joined a program in the U.S. He was part of the program. And it was all about entrepreneurship. How do you start an idea? How do you get mm -hmm. it? And 48 hours, we just give 48 hours for people to, to bring out yeah. the ideas so it didn't stop it just changed the the environment i changed the uh the environment a bit so that i can still be able to make um feel like i'm making yeah, an impact but, yeah. and that's the one you said you get you got tired i i really understand um i'm just looking at some of the events that personally i've the, you know i began with a reading clinic at the martha inspired some days i got tired and i stopped it because it is so difficult, it's so demanding. And right now, I'm, pl I'm still planning for a youth summit in August, but sometimes I feel tired. And sometimes it's so overwhelming that you don't even know if the people you are even impacting even appreciate what you are doing. And the structures, oh my goodness, the schools can be frustrating, the young people can be frustrating, and even those who are not in the schools, like people come for events and you are out of refreshment. Is this an event they haven't paid for? You have put together a venue, put it, of course, you've done this. I remember you had to fly some people from that time. A flight was yeah. 100 cities, but you can imagine yeah. how that cost. We, we brought people from Accra. Yes. So I equally fly people in and out. You have to give them some decent accommodation. The, like when they come, it's like they are everything, including their security is on you. And somebody comes for your event and because they didn't get a bottle of drink, they are saying disrespectful things to you that if you know you couldn't feed that's why you're bringing us to your event and people i remember last year when we brought bella and joe jackson and co after the event somebody tried to there was almost a stand b a stand p to touch bella and i enter because she's quite a bit small so people were around her and she almost fell so i had to open her car and practically let me say push her in the car and people were offended because i didn't give her enough time to relate and you know how people can behave sometimes no no curtsy and i just realized how you brought people and we were all around then i think there was some time that we are rushing over the food and stuff and you know what are you doing? and i just wondered if any of the speakers had had an injury that would have been on your head That's on me. nobody at the event would have said oh i was the one that pushed this guest it's going to be oh peter Wynn invited me on the front pages and it's going to even dent your your reputation yeah now away from affiliate you've stopped affiliate would you advise us to stop when we are tired um i i think um i think i'm going to say this and it's it's something that i learned um just some few months back when i felt i was tired again <laughs> um because you would you'll be tired no matter what yeah, happens you will. whichever endeavor you pursue in life at some point you just get tired no matter how it is and um i asked one investor because i was in a i was in a program like this i was on live um uh live on stage you know talking about what i do and uh when i stepped down there was another panel and on the panel was an investor and i asked he was talking about how you invest in entrepreneurs and all that and i asked you could put your money in the bank or you can put it in a more you know safer investment and you get all your back and you would why do you invest in young people or young entrepreneurs mm. that has a chance of failing 90 percent chance of failing and he said i invest in them because it is hard for them to quit mm. and when he said that i just came home and i'm like i did not know i chose a job that i cannot quit mm. because every time you get tired from this whole thing that we do you go home and like today is my last i'm not doing this <laughs> but you know you wake I've up in the morning before. and then you forgot you just saw something on your phone or your computer like you start working again because of the way we are wired mm. we get tired but we can't give up we only find a better way of you know solving that problem so when he said that I felt so confident about what who I am, not about what I do. Because being an, a social entrepreneur like you, it is you 
that makes what happens. Mm. Like for instance, you calling me 10 times today mm -hmm. or yesterday just to make sure I show up here. It's what makes you, mm. you know, you, you, if, you, if, if you go to do um, any job anywhere um, and get all the money in this world, you won't be happy because mm. what you really want to do is to solve a problem. Yeah. And when you put yourself on solving a problem, you never quit even when mm. you are at the dying mm. moment of your life. Mm. So, of course, I did realize that youth empowerment, and I will say this because not that I have stopped doing uh, youth You've empowerment. You've only changed your strategy on where you I, do it. I have, I had taken a break and I had invested in myself mm. because I've always believed that what you give is what you are. Mm. And for me, it got to a point where I asked myself, because there were a lot of questions, maybe in me, because I had done all these programs and the young people were leaving and I didn't know how is it impacting their life. Mm. Of course, if I had done it continuously and seen you now, I'll be happy. But at that time, I was just seeing them leaving and I wasn't sure. Maybe ask them, how do you feel about it? Oh, I, I like it. But you don't see you don't something see the tangible. It, it, it had to take time. And it was too long for me. So I said, look, I'm taking a sabbatical leave. You know, let me just go work for someone and come back. And then come back and see the, the and, and more so I wanted to because we were also supporting people to learn entrepreneurship. And I had I I, I didn't feel I had learned business mm. on myself. Mm. So all the time I said, Okay, this is how you, you do your business plan. But I have not done it myself. So I said, Why don't you get out there? And use that in plan the gutter, on the field and work. Use the field so that when you are not talking to young people about business, it's out of wisdom. It's yeah. not out of book. And out of experience as well. Absolutely. So I stepped out. And I, you know, I stepped out. I took a job with one company from the U.S. They, they asked me to help them to, to design a project mm -hmm. uh, and, and implement it in the, in, in, in the field with the farmers and all. So I took that opportunity and learned a bit about what it means to be an, uh, you know, to start a business. Mm -hmm. And 11 months into that, I found this idea about Car Tribe. Yeah. And I'm like, this that was, is what that, I want That was to do. where I was coming to. I want <laughs> us to look at the Car Tribe story, how it started and what Car Tribe is all about. Stay tuned, we'll be back. Books by Pastor A. L. Fant. They are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Simple to comprehend, relevant in application, and so lovely to read. Grab copies like Dynamics of Kingdom Influence, Dynamics of Ministry, Marcus King for Church Workers, Money Matters, and she calls herself a woman. This marriage must work. No more curses. Loaded mouth. Secrets of kingdom dominion. The exploits of service. Things fall apart. Church without bleeding pulpit. Singles mingle and many more. Welcome back. Now it's time to hear the Cow Tribe story. How did the name come about? I knew that was the first question. <laughs> Cow um, Tribe. And, and, and it's, it's always been the, 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 the question when people hear about Cow Tribe. And now that we really don't do cow related things and which later we'll discuss, mm. people still wonder why we use the name. But um, like I did mention, um, you know, and I, I don't think the name actually 
had to mean anything because it just came one night, you know, I From just woke up and I just, just felt woke like, up in the this heavens is, said this is a name. And then I remember I just went on Google to Google to see if someone is already using it mm. because it's, it, it was, it was quite interesting, you know, and I think there are other names that inspired me. Um, and, and and basically just knowing that I, like I, I keep saying if you are in the from the rural place of northern ghana there's one thing that you always see you be a shepherd you follow cows you, it, there's a tribe there's a tribe around mm -hmm. you know animals right so um so there is particularly no meaning to the name it's just a brand um but what we do is to support you uh, sorry is to support farmers to access animal vaccines okay and animal health in general uh we started as an uber for vets uh and i'll explain um uber for vet meant that when i was actually when i i was working with this other organization from the us um it was a crop insurance product so the idea was that if their crops didn't do well you pay we pay for the damages okay. either rain or whatever so i i supported to design the, the the product i supported to go out there to the farmers and and, sh and explain how the product will work and how many you know rainy days or dry days we use and all that and and then try to see the experiment it to see how they will receive the, mm. the product and during that process most of the farmers asked why don't you insure our animals? Mm. Why the crops? And then at that time, I, I remember coming back to the office and telling my team that, look, we need to do an insurance program for, for animals too. So that if the animals die, mm. we can pay for the, for the losses, right, mm. mortality. And my boss at that time said, nah, we cannot do insurance for animals. There's too much mortality. And there's no proper veterinary system. Yeah. So, and just so that you are reminded that I'm, I'm not, I'm not spoiling someone's business. But insurance doesn't take away your liability. Mm. Like insurance is not meant to take away your problems. Mm. <laughs> you know. So if an insurance company is coming to insure your car, and the car is likely going to have an accident, so you pay, they will not insure it okay that is why and i'm digressing just if you can edit it later but um the point is that when you insure like for instance if you go for private medical insurance they will tell to list all the chronic diseases right there are certain diseases that they won't insure because it means you'll be going to the hospital every day okay so um the question is why did they want insurance for mortality Hmm. it was because there was a high level of mortality and hmm. that mattered to them than even the crops the crops yeah so um being who i am i was very curious so while working for this company i was also checking to understand why is there high mortality okay because they don't have good veterinary Their services yeah. so i quit this job then i turned my affiliate office into and i remember i actually hired a couple of people to work in that office for car tribe while i work for this other company and they were doing willingness to pay surveys and all those things just to understand how the problem existed and then when i discovered that it was a big enough problem to spend my entire life on i quit this other job 11 months into the job and then i started working fully on car okay. tribe just to see how we can get veterinary services mm. to the very remote places using technology mm. so we when we started we actually we had about seven vets in the office and the model was that if a farmer calls we register farmers give them cards and say if you have any veterinary needs call us and we send so we give them motorbikes call us and we send the vet there to treat your animals and I can tell you there were even times that we had to wake up at 4 a.m. Because someone's car was probably, you know, buffing and the baby won't come out. <laughs> so I have to wake up at midnight, Mid call midwife. this doc doctor <laughs> and say, vet technician and say, go to this community that is like 200 kilometers away, whatever. And it's like hours and hours of riding. So 
Eventually, that didn't work. That idea didn't work because we didn't have enough vets to be able... It, it was making a lot of money for us. Wow. But it wasn't feasible. So, so they pay for their services? Yeah, that they, pay, they would pay when... Farmers would pay when their animals are sick. Mm, but not for domestic use. No, we'll, we'll no, kill no, it no, and no, eat no, right no. now. And as soon as they realize that the, the animal will not survive, <laughs> okay. it goes to the butcher. You know, so it's, it was a really interesting concept, but it wasn't feasible. Okay. And again, we will come back to entrepreneurship. We would have so many ideas, but not all of them are scalable. Mm. So when you think of it in a small way, it works. But when you think of how do I scale this to the whole world, then you realize that it's not possible. Even with all the money in this world, you cannot do anything. Mm. It, so back to the high school program again, it was a nice idea, but it wasn't scalable at that time. So we change the model to more working. Why can't we stop the animals from getting sick? Mm. Because Uber for vet means if they, they are sick, we treat them and they, are, they continue being healthy. Mm. But if we can give them vaccines, DOMS and other things ahead, then the animals will even get sick in the first place. Yeah. And that one you don't need, you, that is more predictable. You can go to one community and vaccinate all the animals, whether sick or not. not sick. You, you get what I mean? So that actually opened the opportunity for mm. what car tribe is now mm. and it's been it started the the concept started in 2016 actually 2015 with the experiment 2016 when i was doing extra research in 2017 when we officially registered it um i think we registered as a an ngo as usual yeah. and would, another interview you can talk about but my the my heart came first, right? So my heart was register an NGO, give it out, you know, help people. But then 2017, I discovered that, but this is a commercial idea. Mm. You know, vaccine is commercial, the products are commercial, mm. the tech side is commercial. Why am I registering an NGO when you can create value? Mm. Because NGOs solve problems, they help to build opportunities, but monetary wise the value is always not seen mm -hmm. in the northern part we need enterprises that create value mm. like you go down south and you see big big companies mm. it's because people are investing but here we have more ngos so i'm like i'm not going to add add up to the number you know, of NGOs. so let's try it as a company and that's when august 2017 we registered as a company and then we started investing in technology uh, i know when we started we were just whatsapp so everything was done. People thought when we said we're a technology company, we're doing anything serious. It was just WhatsApp. The vets had WhatsApp on their phone. I also had a WhatsApp phone. So if the farmer calls, then I'll transfer. We had a script. Then I'll transfer to the vet that farmer A, ID number, this, that, in this location. Then I'll send a location we've already picked before. Mm. And then he will go. Everything was done on WhatsApp. Wow. Yeah, with almost 1,000 farmers. Everybody mm. managed on WhatsApp, right? Wow. So we started on the WhatsApp and it was working. And now we build a whole technology platform mm. around the whole idea. So it, again, it didn't have to be an expensive thing. Mm. We're solving problems, but we're using existing tools, right? Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, so that, is, that is where uh, Car Tribe and the whole vision um, started, yeah. Okay, so now Car Tribe, are you? What are some of the other things you do apart from the, the the animals with the veterinary services? So Car Tribe now is what we call um, a platform for distributors. Is this only in Ghana? No, so we are currently scaling to Kenya, and then Nigeria. So I was, I told you, yeah. we were just in Nigeria briefly. Um, but when we say it's a platform, it's now an entire. I don't know how to explain it in the simple way that my grandmother will understand. <laughs> um, but it's, a, it's a, a platform that connects manufacturers of vaccines in Europe and other places to Africa, distributors of Africa. So we don't even go, Catram no longer deliver vaccine to farmers. Okay. We don't do that anymore. Mm. We rather buy very bulk, you know, we, 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 like, we ship a lot of vaccines. Mm into the country and then the distributors of the vaccines you know use our system to get it wow so we provide them cold chain system so now we deliver with drones because we have partnership with a drone company that your order comes in 
it goes to their warehouse, they pick it and then they drop it with drones because uh, vaccines are not that, they are not, mm. um, you know, it's light, light mm. uh, you know, items. So we do that. I think we've done millions and millions of distributions of vaccines, but we no longer go, farmers don't even directly deal with car tribe anymore. So you see the model has changed a bit again. Um, and now we focus on technology. So mostly if we work with you as a field partner, we give you the tech, we give you training, we, did, we give you the products. And then you are responsible to go out there and provide vaccines and other things to, to farmers. Yeah, so we, are, we call ourselves a platform for distribution services. So the manufacturers too would get the opportunity to see the entire African market, their customers and everything. So it's a very big um, platform that is being used um, for vaccine distribution in Ghana. And we are hoping that uh, we can as, uh, expand to Kenya and then and, 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 and Nigeria. Okay. Yeah. Now, Peter Awin, as a person, what, what do you think we are lacking from your perspective in your development in Northern Ghana? Um, I would not say we lack something. I think we probably need to see certain opportunities. Um, for me, I think the mindset that you, you are born, you get, go to school, get a job, get married, buy a house, live happily is the concept that we grew to understand and so we have so many young people that are killing their dreams mm. because they have this cliche life that they have a picture of what good life mean um i think what we haven't really pursued much is just being yourself mm. so most of us lack self-awareness we don't know ourselves we jump into the world without even asking who am i so if you meet someone with lack of self-awareness, you obviously see how the person reacts mm. to, mm. because there is low confidence, low productivity, everything now becomes, but when someone is out there with the self and the confidence, you realize the person is doing what they love and they are not necessarily following the same route of everybody. Because in this world, a few people will have to, you know, challenge the status quo, you know? And that is what I think we are lacking in the North here. Mm. That's number one if you are looking at it that way. Number two is that because of that, the definition of success and happiness mm. is all around, I have money and I'm spending. Mm. You understand? And it's finished, then I go look for it again and spend. And it's finished. So when you are 60 years, what do you ask yourself? What did I come to this world to do? Yeah. So you need a, an opportunity for people to say, look, I can be 40 years and not be married and I'm still going to be fine. Mm. I'm not saying people shouldn't be married, yeah. you know, or I could be 30 years and not have a job, but what I do makes me happy. Mm. And no one in their family is going to give them pressure. That's true. Because that is what brings innovation in people. If you are feeling the pressure to, to settle down, to do this, to do that, you will never be innovative. Mm. You would cut the corners and you, you, the shortcuts will be in your head. Mm. Because they are comparing you to success being the guy who has the newest car and all those things. So I think having been exposed to different cultures, right, I do think we from the North need to, especially for parents, because, you know, it's really boils down to mm. parenting. I think parents should just relax a bit. It's not going to be bad when the kids really learn to be themselves first. You know, and then they can build something on their own. Mm. If you put so much expectations ahead of them, they will only follow what you have done, which is mm. not going to work for us. Mm. So I think that is something when you talk about youth development, I know you'll be having challenges because then even if you're having a program, you're expecting someone who comes to define the success as there was food at the venue. It's not about I learned from this lady who came up. I mean, at that time we brought Shamima Muslim. And at that time, you guys were so excited about what she was telling you guys because she also had a really good, a certain background. Her wisdom was from her own experience growing up. So you, you were thinking about that. Not, is there food, you know, 
am I meeting the the nicest boy there or the nicest girl there? No, you were thinking about your own empowerment. Mm. So I think that is something that we could we could probably work on as an opportunity. There is this thing I keep hearing that Ghanaian youth are lazy. I don't think so. Um, and I say this because I've been to other countries that Ghanaians, um, so many countries that I find Ghanaians there. And the first thing they tell you when they meet you is like, you guys are slow, but you are very hard working. Mm. You know, Ghanaians are not, we are not, we don't make decisions very quickly. Be so, uh, and sometimes <laughs> like, I'll think about it. You go, oh, I haven't thought about it yet. You go and come, I'll think about it. And then it will take a whole month of thinking about it, right? That's Ghana. That's one of the I'll things we find. You. I'll get back to you. <laughs> we, we, okay, so there are two things. We don't say no. Ghanaians don't say no, outrightly yes, no. Yeah. We say maybe, or I'll think about it. And then you have to tell yourself the no in your head. It's not, he is not going to tell you that. Mm. So we are not lazy. It's just that we warm up very slowly. Unlike the, maybe you go to Nigeria, everybody, when they say yes, they are yes and they are going. In Ghana, we take our time. So that is not laziness. You understand? That's one part of it. The other part is a new culture that I'm seeing around, which is more built around solving, you know, I mean, they say, I, I, I hear someone say, oh, it's called uh, living like uh, a few, one week as a lion than living your whole life as a tortoise. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the whole thing mm. they think, right? Um, but that's not it. You don't need to be a lion. You don't need to be a tortoise. You can be any animal. Mm. So that is the, the whole thing I'm talking about. And in Ghana, you find diversity of these young people. Just that the louder ones will be what you hear more. But I don't think, even if you come to the north here, I don't think you would find really, maybe a, just a small group of people mm. are into certain things that we think is projecting the north wrongly. Uh, but I think thousands of young people are, I meet young people from the north here who are doing amazing stuff. And we, there are so many of them. So I still believe that Ghanaian youth are, even more hardworking than any other, like mm. some other places I've been to. Mm. Yeah. Do you think that the the structures we have for young people to succeed are limited, from either governments or families or even the society, our environment? Yeah. So I think yes, I agree to that, and I think um, if you ask me, I'll say it is a country that is self-sabotaging. Mm. Um, and there is, there is, so you look at this period between the last 10 years and the next 20 years as a transitional period. We are that generation that will never look like any generation that has come before mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And the next one that is coming after us will never also look like mm -hmm. us. So we are more like a, a, a bridge between an old generation and a very fast paced growing mm -hmm. world that the next generation will grow in. Mm -hmm. So when I say we are self-sabotaging is that we have failed to see that opportunity as a country. Mm -hmm. So if I were to say something about how this country would where we should be going to is to invest all our energy on young people okay. like i wouldn't doubt that it will bring us to another level where this country would change within half a century mm. you understand That's possible. because the next generation after us are totally different mm. from us so the next generation are not going to even understand their grandmothers and their grandfathers. That's like the true. way we do understand yeah. our grandfather. Like I will go and sit with my grandma and we would make sense. But my child will not understand my grandmother. You understand what I mean? Because we are the transitional. We are like a bridging Between generation. Between that generation and the new generation. Yes. So when I say we are self-sabotaging, the older people are afraid of the young people. So when you're a young person and you try to do something, mm. the older people see you too to be innovative. Too known. You hmm. understand? Because they don't understand. They don't hmm. understand why we do things the way we do it. And I think that is making it 
difficult for them to make certain mm. decisions to favor young people. Yeah. And until we figure out that the best way to invest in this country is young people, it would continue to be like that. And we will miss the opportunity because all other countries are investing in young people. Mm. And we are here feeling like it must always be older people making okay. decisions. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a break. We'll be back to wrap up. Books by Pastor A. L. Fant. They are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Simple to comprehend, relevant in application, and so lovely to read. Grab copies like Dynamics of Kingdom Influence, Dynamics of Ministry, Marcus King for Church Workers, Money Matters, and she calls herself a woman. This marriage must work. No more curses. Loaded mouth. Secrets of kingdom dominion. The exploits of service. Things fall apart. Church without bleeding pulpit. Singles mingle and many more. So we have 10 minutes to wrap up on this. And then um, I want us to look at parent communication with kids. I've seen you relate very well with your kids. And I, sometimes I don't really even think they are kids. It's like they're your friends. And I think they are good in, uh, they are good with photography as well. How did you uh, come up with that? And just give us your final words. How parents should relate to their kids. Yeah, so just to continue with what we, the, the whole concept of it is that young people are the future. We don't know a lot about the future than them. Uh, number one is because they are more vested in it than us. Mm. And so um, maybe to say my concept of parenting is to be a guide, a guide than, mm. um, and a facilitator mm. than the dictator of their lives. And if you look at it that way, my goal is to guide them to a certain point where they can make decisions mm. on their own. Mm. And one of the role of a parent is to be a friend to their children. Mm. It won't take anything away. My kids actually fear me that much that if they want to ask for something, they would be careful about. I'll be surprised how to, to do hear it. that. 
Um, <laughs> and, and obviously when they are doing something that they know it is not allowed, for instance, they, won't, they can never lie in front of me. Mm. I don't think any of my children have lied to me before. That's in my head, right? Because it's, it's so, you know, there are certain values. I don't have too many values in life, but I don't think kids should be lying. That's one thing I, I have learned. There are just a few values. And then I don't think any child should have a toy of his own. So anytime I buy something, it's either you are the keeper of it, but then it's for everyone. Mm. So there are certain values I bring up. And if they go against those values, they know what their implications are. So I'm very strict at some point, but then beyond that, 90% of the time, I'm mm. just a friend to them. Okay. So even recently when they were part of a competition, you know, I would be the one on my computer playing the music and then clapping for them. And then we are just dancing and all that, just so that they can get mm. excited about what they do. Because at some point it was boring for them, but I have to step in, send them to the the venue ground or mm. just, you know, do whatever I have to do, you know, to just make them feel, you know, um, loved and cared for. And that is the rule of parent. That's the rule of a parent, mm. not to just bring a child, but to make sure the child feels you are also a friend. Mm. Imagine that as they grow, they will also carry you along. That's true. Because they have their own lives on their own. And there are times that they want to say something and then maybe you say, what are you talking about? Oh, Maybe you don't, you won't understand. Mm. But then when you listen, you realize that it's true. You won't understand <laughs> because their life <laughs> is different. <laughs> so uh, being a friend means that they would say you won't understand, but then they will take you through everything, yeah. right? And then you learn a lot about their lives and you can even relate more. And if they have challenges, mm. they won't be afraid to come to you and discuss them because mm. that is the way that you have to. It's been an amazing episode. How many months have I been chasing you? I think since August. Today you are on my show. I'll add it to my CV, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for You're coming. Welcome. And I believe that the seed you have to... It's not just me. I see a lot of people. I see Samiha. I see Robert. I see... Yeah, in fact, a lot of people, I can't even mention their names. That We, we all met them at, at your program. And then 10, 11 years down the line, we, we've all grown and we've all matured. With, we cannot downplay the fact that some of the seeds you sow in our lives are now bearing fruit now. I hope you come back and then uh, <laughs> you come back to, to, to youth development. I'm doing it and I know how tough it is. So even though I'm saying you come back, so at the back of my mind, I'm feeling like quitting. I've done that for seven years and I was telling myself a few days ago that should I even continue? I should just let the seven years be like and change another model. But I think that um, the fact that you said youth should be able to grow especially in the northern zone it's it's very difficult and very tough let's see how god will give us a grace to continue and then you'll be at the back pushing us bit by bit thank you so much for coming on the show i'll be back with thoughts <music>